Hi, and thanks for joining me today. Today I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Enneagram. My book, Teamwork 9.0, is based on a system called the Enneagram, and today I want to give you a brief overview of that system. So why do you want to learn the Enneagram? You know, the, um, as a personality system, which is how I came to it, um, here are some of the you know, fantastic things that I got out of it. One, it gave me an understanding of myself um, better than anything I had encountered before. Really kind of uh, gave me a look uh, under the hood, really what makes me tick. And, um, you know, and both on the good side and the bad side. And um, it allowed me to understand and appreciate some of the behaviors that I might not have been so happy with, but it's like, oh, now I understand why I do that. And that's okay. That's just the way I am. And, um, and now I have, you know, something that, that I can put a name on it and I, and I can work with it and, um, and I can work to improve myself. And so th this was, you know, so important, such a great aspect of the Enneagram. And once you've done that for yourself, it allows you to open up your perspective on others too and be able to understand them, what makes them tick, and be able to accept their, their behaviors. It also allows you to, um, you know, adjust your style to better match theirs and get along with others. And then um, finally, and this is what I speak about in book Teamwork 9.0, is really appreciates what each type brings to the party, especially when working together as teams. And it gives you um, the sense, sense of the value of style diversity on teams. So this is just you know a, a brief example of some of the great things that you can learn uh, with the Enneagram. And um, you know before you um, listen further, you may want to take an Enneagram quiz. Um, uh, I have a quiz that you're welcome to use. It's at www.enneasurvey.com. And that's um, E N N E A survey.com. And uh, you'll find that uh, when, you, when you take these quizzes, that you may score highly on um, two or three types. And I find that it's good to use uh, these results in a process of elimination. So you focus on the top. Um, highly scoring types and then as you listen to this talk or you read about the types then you can start to understand which of those types um, may be your core underlying type. First time I took the quiz I scored highly as a type 8. I was in an environment where you know that's how we had to behave as type 8s um, but Later, um, I came to understand that I'm actually a type 6. So um, you may not score the highest even on your core type the first time you take this. Um, it's, it's a process to you know, really figure out what your type is. All right, so um, again, the, the Enneagram is, is commonly known as a personality system. It describes these nine personality types. The Enneagram's been around for thousands of years, and it really is much more than a, a personality system, um, but it was kind of brought into the West as a personality system by a fellow named um, Oscar Echazo in the 50s. And um, he developed these personality dynamics, um, and then that was furthered uh, by others in the 60s and 70s, um, and it became the popular personality system that it is today. And, um, and, and now the, um, I'm finding with YouTube that there's so much great content on the Enneagram and describing the Enneagram behaviors. Uh, so definitely, uh, you know, search around for Enneagram on YouTube and you'll find some, some great, great um, videos to look at. So once you start to understand the Enneagram, you'll see it everywhere. So one of the places that I saw it was in The Wizard of Oz. 
Wizard of Oz talks about these three types. There's the lion who wants guts and the tin man, he wants a heart and the scarecrow, he wants a brain. And the three centers of the Enneagram are the gut types, the heart types, and the head types. So the Enneagram um, looks like this with these three centers. So the eight, the nine, and the one are the gut center. And they, more than anybody, really um, intuit things. And the underlying issue for this group is anger. And then for the heart folks, they're feeling things, and the underlying issue is emotions. And for the head types, they're thinking about things, and the underlying issue for them is anxiety. So we'll go through each of these now. And um, I'll point out that, you know, when we're in our calm state, it's, um, it gets hard to distinguish the dynamics of the different types. We reveal ourselves more in our stressed state. So as I go through these, um, I will be talking about the, the stressed state as well as the calm state because um, it's where a lot of the behaviors are exposed that will really reveal the type. Now, um, for the gut types, again, there's the three types. And um, an underlying issue is anger. And for each of these three, there's an, an external expression of anger, an internal expression of anger, and then a suppressed expression. Okay, and so we'll go through each one of these. So for the eight, um, again, the, the, the issue is anger and they're the external anger type. So this is the type that is actually most comfortable showing and using anger. And what's going on is when the, the eight wants to secure and keep secure their control of their environment. And anger is their go-to tool for securing control. So as the, uh, they feel like they're losing control, then the anger starts to come out, right? So if you're ever in a meeting, right, and somebody starts to raise their voice and maybe pound on the table, that is an expression of that eight dynamic coming out. And that person is wanting, is using anger to keep, control of the situation, keep control of the environment. So the thing, you know, a, a great way to get along with ACE is to get to the point quickly. ACE, more than any other type, they want to get to action. They don't want to think about things. They don't want to feel things. Remember, they're in that intuitive group. In fact, they've probably already intuited what to do. So they just want to go and do it. They don't want to talk about it. So um, if you do need to talk, get to the point so that they can get to action. So that gives you a flavor of that external anger type eight. Now let's go on to the internal anger type one. Now, all that anger that you saw with the eight, now imagine all of that focused in at themselves. And that comes out as this angry, critical voice in their head saying, you know that's not right. You know you could be doing better. You know you could be working harder. So that voice is the constant companion of the type one. And that voice is informed by the one's intuition. It's telling them what's right and what's wrong. 
ones often use the word should. It shouldn't be this way. It should be this way, right? And that's that voice of that critical, angry voice in their head that's informed by that intuition. So the type one may not identify with anger, but they will identify with frustration. So that's that frustration of not being able to get it right. And that's the way they're feeling that anger, that internal anger coming out as frustration. And it's important to know that, you know, the ones are highly self-critical. That voice is criticizing them all the time. In fact, any criticism that you may think of laying on the one, they've already criticized themselves 10 times more. So in fact, by criticizing them, it just increases their frustration level and will often be counterproductive to whatever you're trying to accomplish. So it's best to just avoid criticizing the one. All right, let's move on now to the suppressed anger type. So the, for the suppressed anger, the nine wants to eliminate anger from the environment. So they're constantly thinking about how can I make sure there's no anger? And, they're, and that's why they're often called the peacemaker because that's their focus. They have this intense focus on understanding other people's perspectives so that they can arrange things in a way that will minimize conflict in the environment. Now, if you ask a type nine, where do you want to go for lunch? The type nine will respond, hmm, I don't know. Where would you like to go for lunch? Oh, no, no. I pick last time. You pick this time. Hmm. Well, you know, I can't really make up my mind. Why don't you tell me? The nines don't want to express their own opinion. Why? Because if they express an opinion, it may cause conflict. So it's much better for them to let other people make the decision. And in fact, they'll even work as a mediator to find the best solution for everybody who's going to lunch so that it minimizes conflicts for everybody. And doing all this work of thinking about people's perspectives and all of this all the time, it's exhausting. So, you know, the, the, the best thing for the nine to escape all of that is sleep. There's no conflict in sleep. Nines love to sleep. And so you, you'll find that nines, uh, in order to uh, avoid conflict, they may tend towards finding ways to just sleep more. All right, so those are the three anger types. Now let's move over to the heart, feeling, and emotion types. And again, external expression, internal expression, suppressed expression. And the issue here is the emotions. Type two wants to have an emotional connection with you. And the way that they do this is they are thinking what you need and that I will deliver that. And when I deliver that, I am going to get your appreciation. And that appreciation is proof that I've made that emotional connection with you. And that's why the two is often called the helper because they're always finding ways to help people. And that appreciation that they need, that they get or from, from people, it's like oxygen. That's why they're constantly looking for ways to 
help people so they can get that constant supply of oxygen back. So because of this desire to have this emotional connection with people, this type more than most any other type wants to be around other people. Now, if you ask the two, do you ever need alone time? Do you ever need downtime? Two will say, oh yeah, absolutely. And, those, and you ask them, you know, well, when, when was the last time you had some downtime? Oh, well, yeah, you know, the other day, you know, I just went out and I just took 30 minutes for myself. So for the type two, 30 minutes without other people, that feels like a long time. And so uh, for, for most other types, we can be without people for a long, much longer periods. But since twos, you know, want to have that a connection, even 30 minutes can seem like a long time. And with um, twos that live alone, what I've found is that they'll often have a pet, some, you know, you know, uh, you know, some some creature to bond with at home um, because they want to keep having that emotional connection. All right, so that's the two. Now we go over to the internal emotional, internal emotion type four. Okay, now all of those feelings and emotions are roiling around inside of them. And if you ask a four, how are you feeling? The four is going to look at you and say, I'm feeling fine. But what they're thinking is, what a stupid question. How can I tell you how I'm feeling when I'm feeling the light against the wall? I'm feeling the color of the slide. I'm feeling the, the audio echo in the room. I'm feeling all this stuff. But if I told you that, you probably think I'm crazy. So I'm just going to tell you I'm fine. So that's kind of the world of the four and um, you know they, they have the ability to sense the emotional content of anything so I was watching a film uh, it's a biographical film of a New Zealand author Janet Frame and one of the scenes in that movie is she's standing at the chalkboard and she's just like looking intensely at this piece of chalk, just so intensely. And you know, she was just feeling everything about that piece of chalk. And that really illustrated the, the four. And the other thing about the um, fours is that they have... The, the ability to put themselves into other people's emotional shoes. Now, we talked about the nine. The nine can put themselves into other shoes to get their perspectives for the sake of minimizing conflict. So they know what's going to, intuitively, they're going to know what minimizes conflict. Okay, different from that, the fours can put themselves into people's emotional shoes and they can know what other people are feeling. Often they know what people are feeling more than they, the, the fours know better than the person themselves. And there was this another scene in this film where the, the actress playing Janet Frame, she comes back to a house after her father had passed away and there are her father's shoes on the floor. She walks over to the shoes, she steps in the shoes, and then she just becomes her father, and just starts being her father. And that so illustrated the four's ability to put themselves into other people's emotional shoes. And they also have the ability to communicate in a a highly emotional, emotionally impactful way. And that's why they often become 
writers or poets or um, musicians, uh, even chefs and cooks, and you know they're communicating, you know, painting, you know, in a in an emotionally uh, impactful way, and what they you know want out of that is to be um, to get acknowledgement for their unique perspective. So that's one of the things that satisfies the fours when they know that they've communicated in a way, especially if they've communicated in a way where it leaves you speechless, you're just feeling, just feeling what they, they made and you don't have any words for it. That's when the four knows they've communicated successfully with you and they have essentially put you into the four's shoes. All right, so that's the internal emotional four. So now we get to suppressed emotion. Okay, so the the threes, more than anything, want success. Success above everything. Success above feelings. They tend to suppress feelings. They don't come into play. They don't come into the equation. So when they're working, they're working, you know, they're not feeling, and they're not thinking about feelings. They're just focused on that success. And that's why they're often called the achiever. And for the three, appearances are really important. And so, you know, you've heard that phrase, dress for success. That's the three. They're going to dress for success. They're going to come out and they're going to look successful and, and, the other phrase that comes to mind is fake it till you make it because even if they're not successful yet they're gonna look successful and and just because they're faking it until they make it doesn't mean that they're not working extremely hard threes are one of the hardest working types and they are going to you know they have the ability to make time because if they need to stay up all night to finish something, they will stay up all night to finish something. So th this is the, um, the mission and the purpose of the three. Where they get into trouble, though, is if they're working on a team and um, they have a deadline coming up and everybody's working hard and then somebody says, my kid just got sick. I need to go home. I need to take them to the hospital. And the three's like, Really? No, we have the deadline coming up. So the the threes don't think about how that person's feeling. It it just doesn't even come into the equation, right? They're just thinking about that success. And so um, at the end of the project, after it's all done, the three's like, "Yay, we did it!" But everybody else is, you know, suffering from hurt feelings of what may have happened along the way and they're like oh we don't feel like celebrating go away you know so this is where the threes get challenges because they're not um, understanding how other people may be feeling um, because they're not that, that it's just not a thing for them and so um, it's just something to watch out for for the threes all right so that is the heart group and now we move to the head group and it's the thinking and anxiety and again we have external internal and suppressed and this time it's for anxiety we'll start with the external anxiety type seven right so their anxiety comes when there is any negativity in the environment that negativity in the environment causes their anxiety to go up. So they work hard to keep n no negativity, but rather just keep the environment light, fun, and happy. And so as long as everybody's happy, then their anxiety goes down, especially if they're happy with the seven. And so if the seven can make everybody happy, then there's no anxiety. So they tend to be fun, talkative, 
always thinking about the next fun thing to do, and that's why they're often called the adventurer. And um, if you're ever in a situation where you know you need to process some negative feelings, it's better not to go to a seven, because the most that you're going to get out of the seven is, don't worry, be happy. You know that's that's about the extent of um, negative uh, negativity that the seven is comfortable with. It's just telling you, just don't feel that way. <laughs> and so, um, on the other hand, if you want to have fun, then you definitely want to you know hang out with your seven buddies because it will always you'll always be able to have a good fun time with them. All right. Next is the internal anxiety. So now that anxiety is inside and that and the way that type 5 addresses the anxiety is if they collect resources that make them feel safe, the anxiety goes down. So what resources make them feel safe? Money that will make them feel safe. Knowledge, information. So type fives tend to be on the quiet side. They're just observing everything. They're taking everything in, collecting information constantly, constantly. And as they do this, their anxiety goes down, makes them feel safe. So for them, information is very valuable. It's like gold. Now, if you need some information from the five, then going to the five and asking for information, well, uh, five's like, why should I give you my information? You know, for them, it's like gold. And if you persist, they're going to think about, okay, well, what's the minimum amount of information that I can give you to make you go away? So they'll give, give out that little bit and then the person will go away and then the five can go back and be by themselves collecting information. On the other hand, they love new information. So if you have some interesting, quirky information, you can share that with the five and the five is going to be, ooh, how interesting. And they'll want to hear more and more and more. So that's one way to... Uh, build a relationship with a five is by sharing interesting, quirky information. All right, so next we get to the uh, suppressed anxiety, okay? And I know this type very well because I am a six. And for type sixes, we push our anxiety way deep down inside. You know, sometimes you can kind of feel it kind of deep down in your gut. It's like this little furnace down there. And that's, that's anxiety that, you know, type sixes commonly feel. And the way we keep it pushed down is if we know what's going to happen, then anxiety is minimized. So we're always thinking about the future. What if this happens? What if that happens? questioning, questioning. So that's why type six is often called the questioners because we're, you know, asking what could happen, what could happen. And we develop these mental models as we run through our simulations of, you know, what is the most likely outcome. And as long as we kind of go along as we predict, our anxiety goes down. It's when things become unpredictable and chaotic, then that anxiety starts to rise up. And that can cause us to be um, a little on the abrupt side. It can cause us to become angry. It can cause us to become frenetic as we work frantically to try to address whatever happened and whatever it is that's causing our anxiety to be up. And then as we work through that issue, our anxiety goes back down and we can make our life a little more predictable. So six is like routines. Oftentimes um, parents of sixes, what they will do to help their child minimize 
anxiety is if they're going to do something new, take them the day before and walk them through. This, this is what's going to happen. This is who you're going to meet. This, these are the things you're going to see. And just let them, you know, see it all. Ask all, they're going to have a lot of questions. Then let them ask all their questions. So that way, the next day, as they're going through it, there's many fewer surprises. Sixes don't like surprises. And so if you can minimize the surprises and help meet expectations, then the anxiety goes down. So those briefly are the nine Enneagram dynamics. And we're just scratching the surface here. And again, personality is using the Enneagram as a personality system is just one aspect of many ways that you can use the Enneagram. And um, so, for instance, in my book, Teamwork 9.0, I talk about how to apply the Enneagram to problem solving. You ask that question, why are, why do you, why is the Enneagram numbers? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, that speaks to the way we solve problems. Fascinating stuff. How can you use the Enneagram to grow as a leader? The Enneagram speaks to that. How can you use the Enneagram to increase your creativity? You can, you can speak to that. How can you use it to um, uh, analyze team dynamics? You can use it there. You can use it for rapport building, and you can use it for underlying uh, motivations on your team members so that you, know, you can individualize how to motivate your team members to work towards the goal. So these are all really powerful ways that you can use the Enneagram with um, yourself and with teams. Um, please do stay in touch. Um, lots of ways. You can uh, go to my website, evolutionaryteams.com. You can find me on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, this YouTube channel, and um, also have a blog. I'd love if you could um, uh, read some of the things I'm writing and leave comments there. Thank you so much for listening to this talk overview of the Enneagram, and I look forward to our next conversation.